Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice lunch. Um, we're going to get the afternoon session started. This GIS in action session started. We've got two presentations today. I'm very excited to have them with us. We're going to start with the ASU Geospatial Map Hub. Um, and I probably butchered that, and I apologize, guys. Um, and then we're going to follow up with Seth Lewis from Tempe. So Matt Toro, uh, Eric, and I, I'm going to let you pronounce your last name because I'm going to Friesen Han. Excellent. Jill and Jill Sherwood, they're missing one of their presenters. Robert Cowling was also planning on being with them today and was unable. So I'm sure they've got it all under control. Um, I want to just do a couple housekeeping things before I stop sharing my slide. Uh, remember to put your questions and answers in your question and answer button. It's different than the chat. That's what we're moderating for questions for the presenters. Make sure you put them in there. Um, and make sure you take the survey at the very end. Um, and I think we will get started. Uh, Matt, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you and maybe you could give introductions for your team. Oh, you're muted. Surely, thank you very much for that, Jenna. That's why we need someone like Jenna staying on top of things. Am I being heard now? Everything okay? Audio wise, okay. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen because we've sort of uh, embedded these intros in here. And frankly, we're gonna focus more on the product itself. But um, before, you know, with our new pandemic lives, we're all quite accustomed to online presentations, but I just want some sort of verbal or visual confirmation that you're all hearing me and now seeing my slide deck in presentation mode full screen. Is that right? Yes, it looks Thank great. Excellent. Thank you so much. So good afternoon again, everyone. My name is Matthew Toro. Today, I'm going to be co-presenting with uh, Robert Cowling, who unfortunately isn't here with us, but also with Eric Friesenhan and Jill Sherwood. Collectively, we represent the Map and Geospatial Hub at Arizona State University Library. And uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here. We're very happy to, to have you all with us, watching us. We're going to be, there's a lot to cover here. So we're going to be, try to be as fast as possible. But today we're going to be describing our new project. Uh, we're calling this presentation Indoor Space Modeling with 3D WebGIS for Library Asset Management, Discovery, Visualization, and more. That is a very ambitious, optimistic uh, title, but we hope the proof is in the pudding and the substance speaks for itself. So uh, again, my team and I represent the ASU Library Map and Geospatial Hub. We hope the presentation that follows will pique all of your interest and you wanna go explore it for yourselves independently. Please visit us at geospatial.asu.edu and you'll learn about the, more about this project and all the other cool things we're doing at the Map and Geospatial Hub at ASU. So again, today we're talking about this fantastic application. We're very excited about it. We're calling it the 3D Explorer and um, my colleagues, Eric Friesenhan and Jill Sherwood, are gonna tell you how it works and, and, and all the things behind the scenes. But first, let me just tell you what it is. As you can see right here on your slide, it's, it's a really cool 3D model, right? It's, it's an interior space model of our unit, which is a specialized unit at ASU Library focused on maps and geospatial resources. So here at the Hub, we hold tens of thousands of maps, aerial photos, and other sorts of geospatial, geospatial data assets. Before we get into, before I show it off a little bit, let me show you all how to get there. Uh, visit our, our website, geospatial.asu.edu, and then visit our projects page right down here. Quick little video on how this, uh, how you can navigate to us. Once you're on our projects page, you'll see more about all the other cool stuff we're up to. Uh, but the 3D Explorer represents one of our core applications that really falls under our core sort of responsibilities of geospatial data distribution, and management, et cetera. So, visit the map and geospatial of that way. And you can also secondarily find all the documentation and quite robust documentation on our GitHub page where, um, where the site itself is hosted. Uh, Jill Sherwell will talk about that more in a moment. So, okay, what is this thing? Well, as hopefully the video on your screen is, uh, is representing for you, it is a, an interactive 3D map, uh, a web scene that uh, models our interior space here on the third floor of Hayden Library in Tempe, Arizona, uh, a suburb of the Phoenix metro region for any of those not local. And as you can see, virtually every object in this model is selectable. I hope my Zoom little image is not uh, obscuring the top right corner of your page. Let me actually turn off my video. 
Uh, hopefully that will not obscure the pop-up boxes that should be appearing on the top right of your screen. But as you can see, everything is selectable from staff offices to globes, to furniture, equipment, workstations. So if you wanna sort of virtually explore what is the map and geospatial hub, you could do that. But the most powerful feature is this one right here, our search functionality. This is not a normal web scene. It has a powerful search function behind it. It allows you to search through our tens of thousands of cartographic materials, maps, aerial photos, et cetera, to see what we really have. So in this case, I typed in Lee's Ferry. We all know uh, that historic location in Marble Canyon, just uh, to the Northeast of, of, of Grand Canyon. And here I selected one of the items in that location, in that drawer, happens to be a plan and profile of the Colorado River uh, from the early 1920s. I can also manually select one of the locations. So I selected drawer, what we call drawer number one, and I happen to select one of the maps in there. You get all the metadata for map for the maps, as well as a nice thumbnail image that you can uh, explore further, et cetera. Uh, let me move to the next slide. I think I'm frozen a little. Hold on. Forgive me, my friends. I'm frozen. Let me let that reset. I'm on Google. This is a Google slide document. Let me not get too trigger happy. I'm sorry that it's frozen here. Let's see. Don't embarrass me, Google. All right. I'm actually right. using an arrow key to move. Yes, I've tried yeah. spacebar and arrow key. Frozen here. That's all right. That's the risk. So we all talked internally. Don't do live demos. It's too risky to ever do a live demo. So I'm like, okay, let's do videos. The next best thing. And there's a price to pay. All right. Finally, it loaded up. So uh, there's another cool feature that I want to show off before Jill talks more about it. But we have this fantastic 360 degree panorama photo viewer that you can access through the image widget uh, on the left uh, menu uh, panel, if you will. And that allows you to view the interior of the hub space photorealistically with an actual 360 degree photograph or the exterior of the hub space. And again, Jill will talk more about that. Let's hope that this transi slide transition is smoother this time. Okay. One more time. Yeah, it was risky to do all these videos. Sorry, my friends. Let me let Google Slides catch up. Let's see. I'm trying both spacebar and down cursor. Let me just give it a moment. I'm on now. I appreciate everyone's patience as we try to get through this slide transition. One more time. All right. So I'm just gonna... escaping and then going into the next slide. Eric always has excellent constructive recommendations for me. The escape button did not work, my friend Eric. So let me try space again, down arrow. Hmm. Okay. So while this is loading, uh, let me see, that one. no, while this is loading, in a moment, I'm gonna pass it over to Jill Sherwood. Jill will be talking about um, the software architecture, the, the entire software stack that goes into this. Um, this application was actually, wow, I'm so sorry, my friends. I'm trying, trust me, I'm trying to transition these slides. I didn't realize the integration of videos would be so risky, so sorry. But um, in his absence, I will uh, sing the praises of Mr. Robert Cowling. Uh, he was a map and GIS intern at the Hub, uh, but he's really the software developer. I, again, my friends, I promise I'm trying to escape out of here and transition this slide. But in a moment, I'll show you a slide. I, I, I have confidence that eventually this will load and I'll be able to transition slides. But uh, there's a slide dedicated to Mr. Bob Cowling. Uh, he's a remote intern. He's actually based on the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. He's getting his second master's in uh, library science. His first master's is actually in GIS and geospatial web development. And he also has an undergraduate degree in geomatics. So he came, he wasn't a, a conventional map and GIS intern. Um, Forgive me, my friends, I'm gonna briefly, let me see. Yeah, I'm gonna briefly stop the share. So sorry for this complication. And uh, I'm gonna boldly try to reshare. Uh, let's go back to presentation mode again. Terribly sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, and I was prematurely talking about Bob. So, so sorry, my friends, you know, technical issues like that always throw people off, including myself. So anyway, let's talk about how this 3D model came to fruition. And then I'll talk about the software stack that was developed by Bob and Jill will do a, a fantastic job explaining how it all works. First, let me hand it over to my colleague, our map and GIS specialist here at the Map and Geospatial Hub, Mr. Eric Friesenhan. He can describe how this model came to fruition. Take it away, Eric, please. 
So as Matt said, I am Eric Friesenheim, the MapGIS specialist, and my job in this was to uh, actually create the whole 3D model. And before it can be turned into a 3D model, the first step is to get the actual raw floor data for Hayden Library, which after contacting ASU facilities development and management, they were kind enough to give us uh, Hayden Library. So as the, as the, uh, the arrow and the little uh, red square indicates, that is where the Mapping Geospatial Hub is in the whole floor, floor plan. But before we can just turn that straight into a fancy uh, 3D space, we have to get rid of all of that unnecessary annotations, the, the position, the way the doors open, and all those other infos on computer workstations, et cetera. All we need is the raw floor data which as you can see here is what it looks like after all the unnecessary info is stripped out. And after that's all out, we then move over into turning it into polygons and simplifying it even further down to just the base squares and outlines. And after that has been converted, uh, it can then be rendered 3D. However, the issue is with um, Polygons in 3D online, they do not retain their uh, 3D infra or shapes. So if you posted it into an ArcGIS uh, web scene, it would show up as just a flat 2D square hovering wherever it may end up being. The solution is to use multi-patches. They are uh, optimized for 3D objects in ArcGIS online. And as you can see in that image, that is what the floor space actually looks like when it's been turned into a multi-patch and properly symbolized with all of the columns, windows, floor, walls, et cetera, having their proper shading applied to them. The next step is to physically measure every single object in the hub uh, raw with like measuring tape and a little piece of paper. After that's done, you can go in and actually create uh, square, cylinder, sphere, et cetera, with the dimensions that are required for said object, type them in and then just place them right down. So that was the process to create every single object you're seeing there uh, in the hub. But just because it's been made doesn't mean it's automatically in the right position. So some of those objects like the computers and shelves, they're all floating off the ground. And the whole process to do that is to use this move tool here you can select an object and then if it's like three feet off the ground, change it to being three feet higher than what it's currently at, move to, and now it's at the right height. And after that's been done, you can just drag it to a specific location on the wall, as you can see with those shelves. But then the next issue came up where you realized, wait, if we want this entire workstation bank that you can see currently selected to show up when you click on any part of it, uh, that's not the current functionality. If I clicked on a computer screen or clicked on a little piece of a globe base or uh, any leg of that table, then only that one object gets selected. The solution to that is actually to create a, an invisible polygon, which you can actually see the wireframes here around the whole object. And after that's been uh, created, it's turned invisible and pushed to online. But this, as you can see here, this is just a little uh, snippet. Uh, everything then gets uploaded to online. And as you can see with that count up there, there's 167 unique uh, layer items being used to create this 3D model. And then after it's all in, it's been pushed into a web scene. The final result is created. And we have this beautiful 3D model of the whole space up and ready to go to be used. Excellent, Eric. So uh, this is the slide I mentioned that I was, I was gonna bring up earlier. This is Mr. Robert Cowling who can't be with us this afternoon, but he's a fantastic, uh, soon to be newly graduated, double master's holding, former MAP and GIS intern. And obviously, as you can see with, with his product, uh, really fantastic. I, I've already uh, killed a lot of time talking about Robert Cowling, but please check out his professional portfolio and profile. But fortunately, we have Jill Sherwood here, our geospatial data analyst, I'm sure many in the Arizona geospatial uh, data community know Jill, and she will uh, explain the software stack behind this whole thing. Take it away, Jill Sherwood. So here's where we really get into the nuts and bolts of the interactive 3D web application itself. And I'm doing so again on behalf of Bob, so please bear with me. Um, as shown on this slide, a variety of languages and libraries were used to create the web application. And in the following slides, I'll go over each of these pretty briefly. 
So the real uh, framework for the web application was the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. And that was used to uh, build a custom web app that was for our specific needs. The JavaScript API also connects the web scene created by Eric and hosted in ArcGIS Online to the 3D web application. It was also used to add more functionality to the app and enhance the user experience. For example, when a user clicks on an object, whether it's a globe, an office, or a drawer, not only is that object highlighted, but a pop-up is also populated with information that was specific to each layer. The user can also interact with a 3D model by zooming in, zooming out, panning, rotating, and if they get lost, a home button was added to return the user to the original view. And that's just a just a brief touch on some of the customization that was added um, into it. So the web app was created in part as a way to allow people to search for and view items that are within our map collection and also to help us with our inventory. Uh, so to query the map inventory table, which is also hosted in ArcGIS Online, the ArcGIS REST API is utilized. And a search is initiated when the user either clicks on a drawer or a bookcase or uses the search which is available within the app. And the search function allows the user to either do a quick keyword search um, if they have interest in specific maps or a more advanced search you know, based on topics or regions. And the results are then returned to the web app and used to populate a table. So in order to view the results that are returned from the REST API, the tabulator library was used and tabulator returns these results in a really nicely formatted table. So when the user views that table, they can see the items in the, either the selected drawer or items related to their specific search. And then once they click on an item, at that point, the app zooms to the drawer where the item is located and creates a pop-up with more information. And that information in that pop-up also includes a thumbnail image of the map item that's selected. So the thumbnail is great um, to see, you know, just a quick view of the map that you're looking at. But we really wanted people to be able to interact with the selected map and zoom in and zoom out and see the detail in all of in the maps that we have scanned. So for this, um, the viewer JS library was utilized. So once the user clicks on a thumbnail, a larger version of the scanned map appears on the screen, and that map can be moved around the screen. It can be flipped, it can be rotated, uh, you can view it in full screen and you can zoom in and zoom out really to see the detail that's in the map. So the initial 3D model that was created um, a while back was actually created for us to view the space where we would be locating in Hayden Library. But because of, you know, especially events, you know, given the last year, we really wanted users to see the space from anywhere. They don't have to come into the hub to actually see what our space looks like. So the Penelum library was used to display a 3D panorama of our space that was captured using a GoPro camera. So users can see and explore the space in a more realistic fashion. And Penelum also allowed us to add hotspots, which provide a little bit more information about the Map and Geospatial Hub, as well as any displays that we may have, such as our map display or the Grand Canyon map that's located on the outside of the hub. I'm just letting this video finish out. So There's the those hotspots that, <laughs> yep. that Jill mentioned can be seen, excellent. Okay. All right, so, um, and then finally, um, just sort of the structure and styling of the site was uh, done with you know HTML, CSS and Bootstrap. And that styling included the font used, uh, the search bar, the buttons, and the modals. Excellent. And then all of this code that was used in the application is documented and stored on our GitHub site. And using GitHub, we were able to save versions of the web app, not only for documentation, but also for version control, just in case something happened as we were updating and editing um, any of the the script or any of the details on the pages. Um, we also wanted to get the app live uh, so that people could view this because um, we all think it's pretty cool. Um, so at this point, the app is hosted as a page on GitHub and using GitHub allows any updates to the code to be automatically pushed to the web app and then reflected on our live site.
Yeah. So Matthew Toro speaking again. Sorry for that uh, awkward delay there. Um, you know, this slide should more accurately be called uh, goals and challenges because they're really the guiding principles that uh, informed the design of this 3D Explorer application. Um, and, and really, again, I can't sing his praises highly enough. Jill did a fantastic job of synthesizing the software stack, uh, software architecture that Bob Callen developed. But uh, Bob was really guided by, by me you know, to ensure that we had a very user-friendly interface. Uh, Bob uh, did a phenomenal job of ensuring that um, most of the screen real estate is dominated by the 3D model itself uh, that was created by Eric, uh, as he explained it earlier. Uh, so it's a really simple, basic interface all of the widgets as, you know, and I'm speaking to a GIS community, um, you know, we're gonna be talking more about the 3D Explorer for other communities, including for instance, the library, the professional library community. And, and, um, and some, of these, some of these insights will be more, more meaningful to them. But, um, you know, the, the layout of the widgets on the left side of the, of the application, um, that's really like a standard ArcGIS online thing, but obviously we added those custom widgets like, like the 3D panorama viewer uh, that's supported by Penelum. Uh, we also added an auto play and auto rotate function just to let the 3D scene. And obviously if you're doing any 3D stuff, uh, you'll know that those, those types of functions, uh, you know, auto play uh, and the 3D uh, panorama viewer are not part of the default. Uh, we also added, if you visit the 3D Explorer for the first time, you'll see the information panel. So these are things that we all sort of guiding principles to ensure that the user experience was as smooth and as painless and frankly, as, as, as fun and enjoyable as possible. But on the back end, you know, in terms of the updatability, if you will, of the application, um, Bob did a really fantastic job of ensuring that uh, the, the maintenance on this thing was quite minimal. So as, as Eric described earlier, all of this, really, the model itself is underpinned by a web scene that is referenced uh, through the JavaScript libraries that Jill described. Um, so most of the updating, most of the elements that need to be updated, such as uh, the master database file, which contains our inventory, such as the various geometries of the 3D model itself, the staff offices, the drawers, the, the computer, all the various objects in the 3D model, they can all be updated through the ArcGIS Online graphical user interface, which makes it quite smooth. You know, in terms of programming expertise, you know, not much is needed to keep this thing alive and thriving. And as Jill just pointed out, all of our documentation is quite robustly uh, available via our GitHub repository. So one day, if this whole sort of roster of the Map and Geospatial Hub team, you know, as a new generation comes and sort of adopts uh, some, of, some of the applications that we built, it will be very easy for them to, to sort of pick up and, and hit the floor running where we left off. So that really concludes it. Uh, there are some, some minor points I wanna make about the future directions of this. Uh, first and foremost, we wanna make sure that 100% of our entire inventory, basically every single map, every single aerial photo, every single geospatial data, anything that's physically tangible that has, that's physically stored in a location, because uh, fundamentally, that's what this app is. It's a, re it's a very dynamic, interactive resource locator. Um, so we want to make sure that anything that has a physical presence in our space is, is included in the virtual representation of that. So ensuring that we have a 100% complete inventory of all the various assets in our space is the, the, the main priority right now. There's also some other sort of cool bells and whistles, if you will. You know, um, we're beginning to experiment with procedural rules for making photorealistic representations. Uh, there was a lot of internal debate about the rendering, the, the simple symbology of this. You know, we can we can color code the cabin, the map cabinets to to reflect the different geographies, the regional geographies of our collection. But um, ultimately, the prevailing wisdom was no. Let's make it look as close to the actual space as possible. And as you saw with that three with those 360 degree panoramic viewers, we did a pretty good job. Actually, Eric did a phenomenal job. Um, but there is also the possibility and opportunity to actually take photos of things like the pattern on the carpet, such as the pattern on you know the, the color of the walls to get it just right. It's almost like being the architect of a dream in the movie Inception. If anyone knows the reference I'm making right now, so photorealistic procedural rules is one other option. And of course, maybe far down the line, maybe purely aspirational, but there is a very uh, viable opportunity to move some of this into a virtual reality space. Um, but the point I think I wanna make is that 
this thing is not done. This is very much a prototype, although it's live and very functional and we're so proud of it. It still is a prototype with a lot of growth um, to come down the line. So again, I just wanna thank you. My name is Matthew Toro. Uh, unfortunately, Bob Callen can be, couldn't be here, but on behalf of the rest of my team, Eric Friesenhan, Jill Sherwood, and the whole Map and Geospatial Hub, thank you so much for hearing us out. Let me stop sharing. And uh, back to you, Jenna or Teresa. This is Teresa. Thank you, Matt and Eric and Jill and Bob in spirit. Um, we do have a few questions that uh, I think would lead right into what you were saying there at the end. Um, Shannon, actually, at the beginning of uh, your section, Matt, ask, are there any security concerns having all of this information available online? Wow, I really like that question, Sharon. Um, yes, we actually did contemplate the potential for security concerns, but fortunately, we, um, we're a humble academic library-based unit. So, um, and frankly, at the library, we're all about open access, open information, full transparency, so while there was certainly uh, an acknowledgement of that potential risk, um, no, we sort of evaluated pros and cons and we ultimately decided that making this completely transparent, completely replicable and available through our GitHub repositories, putting our entire inventory online. I mean, that's the whole point of libraries, right? To make everything entirely discoverable and accessible. So um, it, it's a very valid concern and I'm really happy that we have such an astute uh, audience here at AJIC. But uh, no, ultimately we weighed the pros and cons and we said, no, uh, it's, um, the risks are low enough to, to put it all online. Great question, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, and then during uh, your section, Jill and Eric, um, actually Lucas' question had went away somewhere, but it said something like they use CAD and they wondered what kind of um, software that you used for that modeling. I think Eric Friesenhan's the most appropriate guy to speak up on this. Eric. So um, that CAD data that was provided to us by facilities, I could actually import it directly into ArcGIS Pro. And there was a tool um, under ArcGIS Pro that would convert the CAD data directly to a uh, file format of my choice. Uh, so I chose a shape, a shape file and it would then turn it into just polylines within that shape file, which then allowed me to very easily just manipulate it or edit it however I wanted in Pro. Yeah, fortunately, working with the raw CAD was quite minimal. And of course, as we all know, but either on, on any uh, Esri desktop application and including on open source GIS desktop applications, QGIS, et cetera, there are plugins and, and, and natively in, in the Esri software suites, Ar ArcGIS desktop, or of course, as you saw, we use uh, ArcGIS Pro, uh, you know, there's simple uh, CAD, uh, DWG to, uh, you know, to, to multi-patch or polygon conversion tools. So as we all know, GIS software, um, handles CAD quite, quite proficiently. Excellent, great. Um, and we have uh, another question from Jeff. Can you add download? Can you add a download option to any of the selected maps? That is, is that possible? yeah, that's a fantastic. So, uh, and forgive me that I sort of uh, glossed over it, but that that is sort of um, enveloped in our future aspirations. So. Uh, Jill pointed out how, you know, when you select an, an individual map record or you select a location such as a map cabinet drawer or a filing cabinet drawer, it'll show you every single object in there. When you select each one of those objects, it'll show you all the metadata, you know, the author, publication date, yada, yada. Um, and you can access a thumbnail immediately. Uh, the the long-term uh, aspiration is to get all of these maps in a, a fully uh, a triple IF uh, image viewer with full download options. So yes, uh, of course, again, in the spirit of discoverability and accessibility, we wanna make sure that everything is 100% retrievable as a self-service model. We don't want people to have to come through us, but it takes time to get all that infrastructure built. But yes, that's exactly the direction we're going in. Wonderful, that's great. And um, I think that was all the questions we had um, in our chat here, but I do have a question for you. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa, yeah, please. You betcha. So what kind of time did you have to invest in making these, these models and these, these um, designs that, that for is, just that room? That's a fantastic question. So, And actually, I love your corner office, by the way. I saw they kept clicking on that. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. So I actually, um, there's a lot of background here and I don't have time for, I don't want to chew into Seth's uh, uh, presentation time, but basically a lot of the impetus, impetus for this was we were actually migrating this entire map collection from one building on ASU's campus to another building. So we've actually been experimenting with a 3D prototype for over three years now. 
And um, so we've had iterations of the 3D model in existence, both for our previous space and our current space. Um, Eric can probably speak with more authority here, but we've been tinkering with this. You know, I, I've always had the vision to sort of map the map collection, right? Meta level mapping. Let's 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 make a map of all the maps here. But um, and we've been tinkering with it for quite some time. But the the latest iteration that you all saw today was uh, really refined and uh, sort of perfected, if you will, close to perfected by Eric. Eric, if you don't mind, in the last seconds available to us, how many hours would you say you've invested just getting everything right now? Admittedly, we did have some of the we learned a lot of the workflows through these experimentations. So Eric was able to sort of take a baton and run with it, but Eric added his touch to refine it. Eric, how many hours would you say collectively did you invest? Uh, well, unfortunately, it, what ended up happening was the whole thing had to get redone, but uh, it took like two, three months uh, of work overall to it, it, get everything work. ready to go. I, I should say, yes, uh, sorry to, to speak over Eric, but yeah, intensive work. Basically, we, uh, we had a very talented intern, Bob Callen, and we wanted to make sure that we uh, sort of took advantage of having this highly skilled intern with us. So uh, it was really a, a team effort, a very focused team effort for two or three months. Okay, great. That was that was wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank the three of you plus Bob in spirit. Um, that was a wonderful pr presentation and great explanations of the questions uh, by the attendees. Um, so now we're gonna, yes, thank you, thank you. So now we're going to, to, to move into uh, Seth uh, Lewis. Uh, he's going to be speaking about mapping road closures effectively. Um, and uh, he's from the city of Tempe. So take it away, Seth. Thank you, Teresa. OK, um, can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, um, you can. Sorry. <laughs> I had to unmute uh, again. Thank that's you. quite all right. Um, so I'm Seth Lewis. I'm from the city of Tempe. I'm the lead on the programmer and sysadmin in IT on our enterprise GIS team. I'm going to talk about today for a few minutes about road closures, mapping road closures. And one way we've done it when we're faced with, as an agency, you don't have staff who maintain a network, or you don't have an LRS linear referencing system, you don't have some intrinsically to a spatially automated way to turn some intersection values into uh, some points or some other representation of where closures are happening. Um, there's my email. I will, uh, just a note at the top, I don't tend to include a lot of my slides. So there is a link to the slide deck at the end where you can comment and you also have the email. So just an FYI, I tend to use a lot of pictures and just talk. Um, so what, what is the problem? The problem is as an agency, uh, we face uh, issues not unlike many agencies, which is that we run lean as a staff. And when it comes to the issue of showing where uh, road closures and, and those types of permits are happening, um, we just don't have the staff to, to create or maintain that data effectively. And also we're, the city as of Tempe is busier than ever when it comes to the number of permits we're issuing. Um, if you've driven through Tempe, the number of developments, number of traffic snarls due to these types of developments and, and permits being issued. So uh, we're trying to, we were trying to provide our engineering staff with um, a way for them to see the full picture of where work is happening is work being asked by two companies that's going to overlap on the same week or the same period and have that greater insight and to spot those conflicts before they happen. Uh, and we live in an era with some, with in terms of traffic mapping with uh, ways, for example, where it can be self-reported by, by users from their phone. Um, also, Google Maps, that it shows traffic congestion patterns based on just passive detection by Google servers. And then by AZ-501, to which we actually, like many agencies, send um, closure information. And AZ-501 is great for a, a quick snapshot, high-level view um, of, of where work is happening. But from our customers, our engineering staff came to us and said, this, 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 this works fine in certain business cases for the public or some decision makers, but from a, a professional engineering standpoint, when we're, when we're inundated deluge with permits, we need to know more than just where that point representation is. And I'll give you an example. This is downtown Tempe, uh, a screenshot I took, and you have highlighted 
a particular um, particular closure or particular piece of work that AZ501 is showing. So we'll zoom in to that part of Tempe on Broadway. And that point, I, I don't know this for sure, I'm just using this as an example, that point that you're seeing there in the middle uh, may actually be this. And so to our engineering staff, we're wanting to, sh we're wanting to come up with a time, uh, an effective solution that respects their time, respects the time of times of multiple parties uh, to maximize business process and workflow. So that's, that's the context that we're approaching, we approach this. So as I said, we're wanting to maximize information gain to our, our stakeholders and our staff, and while at the same time minimize time required. Uh, we've tried this before. This has been an ongoing issue facing our team and, and our internal staff for a couple of years. We, when I started back in the middle of last decade, uh, we approached this, uh, we're an Esri shop like many agencies, and we approached this uh, using one of Esri's, um, kind of, we didn't exactly use this solution, but it's, it was analogous or similar in, to this solution, which is just a, a, an Esri kind of pre-built Fire, uh, fire, and it generates all these layers in ArcGIS Online uh, with a certain template, certain schemas, certain subtypes, and pre-built form inputs, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you're an Esri shop, you have Enterprise ArcGIS Online. You can spin this up with a few clicks. You don't have to be a developer programmer to get this up and running um, in a few minutes. And that's that's one of Esri's selling points if you're if that fits your use case. So we tried this, and uh, ended up working briefly but it ended up failing and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, there, if you're not an Esri shop, there are other options. Uh, there's a free and open source solution uh, from a nonprofit group called Mobility Metrics. They have a referencing system, that, uh, but they have a UI you can fork on GitHub. You can see the demo uh, URL at the bottom of the screen. You can fork this on GitHub, it's written in TypeScript. You can run it on Linux box and serve it out. And uh, we looked at this uh, more recently, and this presented, and this is nice, it runs on Mapbox uh, GLJS, um, uses modern libraries and it's very performant. Uh, the problem with, with this for us was um, it, it also presented a problem that, it presented the problem that um, you, you can't easily integrate it with an enterprise. So you could download, you could have the person draw the line or the, the closure and get some information, but then they would have to download the um, a GeoJSON, not even knowing what a GeoJSON is, and then send it to you. And you're having to set up these, these convoluted pipelines to, to effectively get the information to in front of the customer's eyes. So uh, in both cases, uh, came down to their base, it just took too much time. And time, you know, as I see it, is, is an, as an impediment to a workflow. Well, whose workflows? Uh, initially with the Esri solution, it was public information officers. We were asking some PIOs. They were, they were very much, um, they were being, being given a Word doc that had in text format, a dozen, two dozen work road closures per week. And gratefully, they offered to try this uh, with that, something like that Esri solution I showed a moment ago. But it became clear very soon that this was, taking up too much of their time and, 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 and in fact, asking them to do a job that they're, it's not, it falls outside their, their duties. And so they would have to look at a piece of text like you see on your screen, College Avenue, Southbound, Lanes Closed, et cetera, et cetera, and read that, open up an Esri content item, web app builder, et cetera, et cetera, and spatially orient themselves to where Curry Road and Marigold are, and then proceed to go through and uh, you know, fill out those forms and doing this a dozen times, two dozen times a week uh, became prohibitive. Uh, same, some, sometimes we have permits that are, um, are vague where it says university drive from rural road to 1000 feet east. Well, that's not easily, I, I don't know how offhand you would uh, programmatically um, put that into any type of system or network if it's a thousand feet, 1500 feet, et cetera. And for asking a PIO to judge what is a thousand feet east. Um, so it just, be, it's a bit of a difficult ask. So it became too much for them time-wise and it was just unfair because it, it's not actually what we hired them to do. Um, what about traffic barricade companies? Well, uh, we'll come back to them in a minute, but overall uh, they're not necessarily technically savvy. So asking them to, to draw a line and then fill out um, all of these form 
elements when they're already filling that out as part of the permit process originally. So we're asking them to, as part of their desire to do business with the city to fill out duplicate forms of information. Um, that is that was something that from just a, a relation standpoint between the city and the companies um, wasn't something we were interested in asking them to take on. And then, but we'll come back to the traffic companies in a moment because they do play a role in this. And then what about our traffic transportation engineering staff, the professional engineers who are reviewing these plans and determining if they should be approved and if they fit uh, within all the guidelines that uh, for approval. Well, they're, again, they're not GIS uh, professionals and, and granted Esri has come a long way in, in providing no code or um, solutions for staff to do this type of digitizing but they're already busy enough with the, the deluge of permits that I referenced earlier. So um, that would, I th we've determined that they would face the same, um, the same impediment or, or pro problem eventually as the PIOs, which is we're asking them to do something that's not necessarily their job. And so the, the customer adoption, the, the success they're in uh, would, would suffer, would be unlikely. So, so a solution we came up with, which is a bit of a hybrid solution, um, so to speak, is a mixture of what we, uh, policy change and technology. Policy change, uh, we working with our engineering department, our tra transportation engineering staff, the directors and, and the decision makers, we uh, have convinced them and, and they've worked with the traffic uh, barricade companies um, to shift our approach and and to say we're we require when you submit a permit you'll get an email it'll have a link and your permit number and you have to go to this link and make some attempt at geospatially digitizing what you're doing if it's of a sufficient length or a sufficient size if it's an entire neighborhood then and we have a help doc for this i'll show in a moment um then you can draw a polygon if it's one segment you can draw a linear feature uh, we're just asking you to try to, to give this a shot. And we've been doing this in a pilot for six to seven months now and have had success with a few targeted companies that we felt would, would be good to try out. But so we, we said to some companies, uh, this is going to be required. But we're just, we just have to shift our position on this going forward. And so we're going to ask you uh, to do this and, and in order to have your permit accepted. Um, on the technology front, uh, what we've done is we've set up some ETL pipelines from our permitting system, which is a cell of like many public agencies. And we bring those um, objects into our enterprise GIS and our uh, data warehouse that we set up. And so, and then on the right side, again, being in Esri shop, we can expose that through REST APIs, through ArcGIS server middleware and, and so forth and in ArcGIS online. So this is how the, um, this is a, a very a simple screenshot of what the traffic control companies see when they're given that link and that number they're told to put in. Uh, this is just a standard Esri JS 4X boilerplate, some boilerplate code with a, a nav bar, a couple links to a help doc, a how-to video we actually recorded. Um, one of my colleague, Melissa, uh, recorded. And uh, we're just using, a what's called, as we call their editor class, editor widget on the right that's hooked up to one of those feature services. And this will start over in a sec, but this is just a, a, a GIF of where they're selecting which type of um, closure they're implementing. And we're asking them to, again, just make an attempt at drawing that and then just put in that one piece of information, just copy that one key, that permit number, that TCP number, to, that's all we're asking, nothing else. Just draw the line, the polygon and paste in the number we gave you and hit add and it'll go, because we used what's called reference data, it goes right into our backend system. There's no disconnect between hosted ArcGIS online data and something that you might run on-prem. So immediately, um, that feature, uh, whether it's linear, polygonal, um, you can see on the screen, example, TCP123456 uh, goes into that SQL Server instance um, and into, the, into that feature layer, that feature object, feature classes, as we call it, and then is available to us to do whatever we wish to with it, publish it um, through, through various views, which I'll show in a moment, uh, to our engineering staff so that they can those items, those objects can be consumed, rendered, 
manipulated if necessary in other front end content pieces like ArcGIS dashboards. So in this case, uh, here, here's just a sample view of the some um, some linear as well as polygonal um, data that have been in input. Um, this is just an ArcGIS dashboard that's tying into several views that we're running off our enterprise. And like I said, if, as, because we're using what's called reference information, when someone uh, puts in a, a closure, it immediately goes in to the enterprise to a geospatial database and then gets served out on the with the caveat that it's matching, it's a valid input. So if someone types in uh, an alphanumeric string that's um, not matching um, any of the permitting records, then there's that's obviously not going to get picked up. Um, but assuming that it's a, a valid TCP number or permit number, and then it shows up here the next time the the uh, engineer comes in to look at, to review this. And so let's say I clicked on this um, line down near Kiwanis Park, a pop up comes up, and it will zoom into the pop up, and you can see it has a barricade submittal, the permit number, the uh, status, some other information about the submittal. And we're actually pulling this the way we've pulled it over from Acela. We've we have multiple tables, so it's not just one um, large normalized table, but it's parsed out. Um, and so we have an information table that contains many more fields than what you're seeing. But for engineering's purpose, uh, this will suffice. Same contact. Who's putting this in? Who's the contractor? Uh, from where and to is this location? being um, this permit being requested the, the work to take place and then scheduling information. Um, when is it supposed to take place? How long is it supposed to take place? The nature of work, weekdays only, et cetera, et cetera. You can see that. And this is, um, we, can, we can accomplish this because Esri has made some strides in recent years with what they call their arcade expression language, which is a, a low code, solution to um, some some providing some more flexibility at runtime with either rendering or pop-ups configuration. And so in this case, what we're doing is we're, we just have an arcade expression that goes through when the user clicks on a feature, it takes that takes that lookup value, that permit number, and it goes out and, and checks for valid um, valid key values in all those other REST API endpoints and slots those in you know, within a couple, you know, a few hundred milliseconds and not noticeable to the end user. And so it, allow, it frees us up to structure on the back end the information in a, in a performant professional fashion, not having to again normalize everything into one long uh, table or one long feature, but we can break it up and according to best practice, but still get the benefits uh, on the front end at runtime. And then if the, as I was saying earlier, you know, we ask them to make an attempt at digitization. If the um, traffic control company has made a particularly wonky, as I would say, um, attempt or, or representation of the work they're doing and the engineer goes in and sees this or one of his colleagues uh, on the team goes in and sees this, then at the bottom where it says edit this submission, we're just using simple URL params to then open another window. Um, not really an easy way to get around this. But to open another window in online or enterprise is just an old um, uh, web app builder instance with a, a widget and we just open it, pass in that URL param of the object ID they clicked and it just fires up the, uh, the widget and just automatically opens up that so they can go in and quickly, if they need to tweak that, if it's too long, if it's somehow um, off a street or so forth, um, they can go in and quickly adjust that as needed. So. That's, um, that's pretty much just what we've worked on to try to solve this problem the best we can. Like I said, the, we've been in a, somewhat of a pilot phase for the last six to seven months. We feel that we've gotten strong adoption and positive feedback from the engineering staff, and, and they feel that they've gotten a good adoption from the, the traffic barricade companies um, that they've been working with. And uh, there are some pros and cons as we wrap up. Um, one, one possible con of this is I'm presenting this from a position of an enterprise where I have, I have access to back, you know, SQL Server and ArcGIS Server and all the licensing you can want and so on and so forth. 
uh, if you didn't have access to that, something like this might be possible. You, there would be some hoops to, to jump through where you'd have to maybe get the, you could use host RGS online information, information layers, um, and you would have to figure out a way to get the, the permitting information up into RGS online. So maybe you could do some arcade expression just entirely within RGS online. So there would be some, some steps um, you would have to, that would be added to this that as, a, as an agency, we're fortunate to not have to step through, but it might, it would probably be possible with some added work. Um, the other pro is probably at the end of the year, we'll, we'll assess this and determine uh, if we're in a position to release th this information publicly. Um, our position on open data is that we're open by default. And so what we would like to do is put this out and for the public with permissive licensing and uh, let the public do as they wish. This would also allow us to participate in the Ways uh, Connected Citizens Program, their CCP, which allows for us to give them our uh, JSON, our features, so that they can uh, put, the, put it in their uh, front end interface. And then we can also get access to all of the rich information that they have, and we can use that to make better decisions internally. So we're looking forward to the end of the year to sitting down and assessing um, and hopefully uh, being able to put this information out publicly and with some of that rich information out of the permitting system that we highlighted. And like uh, the other con is, or possible con is, we're, we are relying on a human factor of that TPC number. Um, if someone doesn't, if someone types, again, not a valid number, it's not going to necessarily um, get sh shown on the map. And there are ways around that. You can, we can run reports showing invalid inputs and submissions for the certain period of time. You can do all that. But what I think we're hoping for is back to that policy change point that uh, we would be able to demonstrate the value add to the traffic barricading companies of, of taking one small step to work with us and that they would get uh, a more effective return on their time um, from our staff that they can they can make decisions more effectively more capably and more timely to get those permits approved so the barricading companies can get on with their work so we are leaving it up to a bit of, of a human factor um, and so that's just something we'll um, we'll keep an eye on as we go forward. So uh, Teresa, Jenna, that's that was the uh, talk. I'll stop sharing and answer any questions as best I can. Thank you, Seth. That was that was that was great. Actually, I have one real quick question before I get to the uh, my question before I get to their questions. Um, TCP those numbers does. Every person have them when they go out in the field. Is that why it's kind of based on human stuff, or is it something that's given to them after they start the project? It's given to them after they, um, after they. Uh, so I, I didn't show this, but when they when they want to uh, request a permit, they have to go through a, a different UI that's managed by a different team in IT here, and they fill out all this information from to weekdays, so all this information is already getting put in. And then when they submit that through our seller permitting system, they get that number. The number is then sent to them um, by email. And so um, so they do have that. Um, the, the, the permitting pr part in the seller is that first step, um, I guess, if, if that answers your question. Um, so they would have that number when they, when they you know, go onto that minimal interface we provided. Does that answer your question? That does answer my question. Yeah, okay. that's similar to uh, Rex and National Guards. After you start the project, that you actually get a number, right. and you need to retroactive that and put yeah. that on all your paperwork. Okay, so we have a couple of questions here um, in no particular order, um, and I think this kind of leads into what you were just saying about five minutes ago, Seth, um, about the uh, barricades. Um, what about temporary road closures? Um, for example, running or biking events. Do you know that happened? Maybe I'm going to just add to that, like for a day or for a weekend. Would you know about those? So uh, that's a good question. We have we have had discussions with. Uh, by the way, on, on the screen, I started sharing again. Link to the slide. You can view and comment, and then my email, of course. Uh, we have had discussions with uh, our special events staff about. Um, we we do know about them. We've had discussions with our special events staff about developing a, a solution uh, with the pandemic. Those those talks kind of abated, but. Um, but it's a good it's a good question we don't those aren't part of this workflow right now but but in terms of something like iron man which is on the 17th 
thereabouts. We can back. Um, there are a lot of complicated, um, complicated uh, road closures that are. If you go to, if you search Tempe event road closures, you'll you'll get some. Uh, you can get a word listing, a word description. And that's something we would, ha we would have to face next if, if based on our assessment, if, if we think this is successful and worth iterating into a different realm, in like you're saying, temporary events, special events. Um, how, do we, how do we maintain that respect for everyone's time, all the stakeholders' time, as well as maximize that information gain? Because it's just a bit of a different, um, intrinsically, it's, it's a bit of a different information load so would this still fit um, capably where you're having to do eastbound, westbound, and would, a poly would drawing a polygon and linking to a TCP be sufficient? We haven't really dug back in to those with our special event staff to determine that yet. But we do have the information in advance, yes. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I was thinking about uh, the Ironman coming up. I know that's, that's a pretty big event. That's why I said the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure those are closed for quite a while. Uh, between the biking and the uh, running. So, um, and the swimming, but that's just in the lake, right? Uh, so one of the other questions is, um, so your input there that you were having the people use, I, I noticed as well, um, is that survey one, two, three, or can you use survey one, two, three with uh, field tablets? Um, or, or what it was it that yeah. you were using, I think was yeah. kind of what they were getting at. Oh, oh sure. It's um, it's not survey one, two, three. Survey one, two, three, um, it, it's, um, I'll come back to survey one, two, three in a moment. It's a good question. Uh, we're using a, um, the Esri JavaScript API and it's just some boilerplate code that we've tweaked very in a very minor fashion. Uh, and what Esri does is it allows for, in the same way that as in ArcGIS Online, they have some, or enterprise, they have some templates, some instant apps that allow you to do some editing. It's the same thing. It's just um, you're just using, you're just hosting the code in the application yourself. And what it does is it allows, it's functionally, it's the same as if you're opening Pro and, and adding a new feature, or creating a new feature that's linear, a new feature that's a polygon, you're just doing it through the browser. So we're just using the Esri JavaScript API, albeit some, some boilerplate code that we pulled down from their resource page. So, but as far as serving one, two, three, uh, it does have its use cases in our, in our instance, it prob probably pre presents a more effort than uh, we, could, we could get more mileage from just using the, the JavaScript API and serving one, two, three, because uh, last I checked, I'm not a serving one, two, three expert, but the, you're putting in point information and the schema, the way that serving one, two, three records information behind the scenes, uh, they can, it can it's point information then you're having to join that uh, so it can be a bit of a a mess um in depending on your business case so we're using yeah survey one two three is not really a fit for us this case some other cases yes gotcha well thank you um very much Seth. that was that was very informative and uh and previously thank you matthew um eric jill and bob in spirit um two great very incredible presentations. Um, is there anyone else that has any other last minute questions or items they would like to add? If not, I'm going to go ahead and put that uh, thank you for attending screen up um, and say thank you again to all of our presenters. Um, I really, really appreciate everyone's input. Um, some great questions um, and the panel answered very well. So thank you. Thank you all very much for presenting. Thank you, Teresa and Jenna for hosting and to all of Ajik. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, thank Thanks you, everybody. Yeah, thank you.